Hello and welcome to PFF Now. I'm Doug Kai, joined as always by Ari Mayrov and Brad Spielberger. Really eventful day today in the NFL. Let's talk about Russell Wilson first, traded to the Denver Broncos for two first round picks, two second round picks, three players, quarterback Drew Locke, defensive lineman Shelby Harris and tight end Noah Fant, and a fifth round pick. Broncos got Russell Wilson and a fourth round pick. Yeah, that that fourth, fifth swap is really what got the deal done there at the last minute there. But uh, a lot of people very shocked by this news. Ari, what was your initial reaction to the trade? I wouldn't say I was shocked by it, Doug, because we, we've spoken about this. Remember, guys, when we had the Von Miller trade and we were like, the Broncos are positioned this offseason to go out and find a big-time quarterback quarterback because they have the ammunition they have a roster from top to bottom that has a bunch of building blocks and really all that is missing is a quarterback and you look at George Payton the work that he's done in under two years now there in Denver really the ultimate goal this offseason was finding the quarterback and as soon as they knew that Aaron Rodgers was not going to be a possibility the next viable option out there would have been Russell Wilson it was a perfect situation where it's a team out of conference so Seattle will be Seattle will be okay with it and Russell Wilson was okay with coming to Denver and you look at that roster you have an offense with Javante Williams and Tim Patrick Corlin Sutton Jerry Judy Albert O as they call him at tight end an offensive line that's above average and the defense as well has a bunch of nice players there including Patrick Sertain and Justin Simmons is a team that is ready to win now obviously the AFC is very stacked but overall Russell these past two years has been in in a suite at the Super Bowl, watching these quarterbacks switch teams and immediately winning a Super Bowl. He wants to be that type of guy. Seattle's kind of entering a bit of a, re a rebuild and he entered a situation now where he's going to have a chance to win right away in the AFC West, a division that is just stacked right now. Did notice he didn't want to say Albert Okuwebanam. Don't blame you. Albert O is the safer way to go. Uh, Brad, talk to us about the salary cap situation here, not only for the Seahawks, but also the Broncos. Uh, did the Broncos need to do anything else to make this trade go through? And what's the Seahawks salary, salary cap situation looking like after this deal? Yeah, so the Broncos only lose about $15.4 million in salary cap space. Shelby Harris, a good player, but a 31-year-old defensive tackle with a $7.5 million salary going back to Seattle. You know, Drew Locke and Noah Fant on those rookie contracts clear a little bit of money. But from a salary cap standpoint, they're still healthy, and I think that is a major takeaway. Now they're still healthy. They didn't give up any of those premium, premium players. I mean, yes, Noah Fant was their 2019 first-round pick. Uh, you know, going into this fifth-year option decision this offseason, but Jerry Judy sticks around, Bradley Chubb, Patrick Sertan, as you mentioned. So that is still a very good roster that still has salary cap space. Obviously not many draft picks going forward, but uh, I thought that was the main takeaway. At the same time, you compare this trade to the Matthew Stafford trade last year, just two firsts, a third-round pick, and Jared Goff to get Matthew Stafford. And if the way, you know, however you want to look at Jared Goff's inclusion in that deal, this is a blockbuster, a truly massive trade for Russell Wilson. Um, and, and I think it does show that Denver was just frankly unwilling to bring this talented of a roster into an AFC West with Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, and Derek Carr, but really just having another season where they weren't going to contend for the one simple reason being they didn't have a quarterback. As for the Seattle Seahawks, now in an NFC, you know, the entire conference lacking in quarterbacks, they have a $26 million dead cap hit, which is actually the second largest in NFL history behind Carson Wentz, what he left behind in Philadelphia, but they do. They can now start over. They sent the number 10 overall pick this year to the New York Jets for Jamal Adams. They just leapfrogged themselves, getting the number nine overall pick from the Denver Broncos. So they can kind of hit the reset button and figure things out, but Unfortunately, they took a gamble. They tried to push themselves over the top by adding a safety for two first round picks and a third round pick. And this is probably what's going to happen more often than not when you do that. All right. You did say that we've kind of mentioned this type of thing before. And way back in December, I reached out to a league source. I've talked about it on an, a PFF now uh, before. I asked him, do you think Russell Wilson is going to force his way out of Seattle? And he responded, no. I think that, you know, the Seahawks would want to trade Russell Wilson. And that's pretty much exactly what happened here. Uh, I thought it was interesting that in the initial, initial reporting, the trade was pending a physical and Russell Wilson's approval. So this was not, you know, Russell Wilson going to the Seahawks and saying, trade me or else. I think at the very least, this was a mutual decision between the Seahawks and Russell Wilson. And I even heard today that, you know, the Seahawks 
were kind of wanted to get rid of Russell Wilson, that, that, you know, some of the drama that had ensued between Russell Wilson and the Seahawks had worn on them a little bit. It is interesting though, because as recently as the NFL scouting combine last week, Pete Carroll said that he had no intention of trading Russell Wilson. I think that that set off uh, alarms to a lot of people that Russell Wilson was not going to get traded out of Seattle at the same time. I thought the wording there was always pretty flaky from Pete Carroll, from Russell Wilson. Pete Carroll was saying, we have no intention of trading Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson said, my plan is to stay in Seattle. All the while, Pete Carroll could have decided not to trade Russell Wilson. So it had nothing to do with intention. He could have said, we're not trading him. Russell Wilson has a no trade clause. So he could have said, no, I don't want to be traded. But they kind of dance around it, and this is what got done. Uh, I think that the final piece here is what the Seahawks do at quarterback. And one name, somewhat interesting to toss out there. Ultimately, I think it's doubtful that it happens. But Kirk Cousins of the Minnesota Vikings, I've been told that Pete Carroll likes Kirk Cousins. Uh, the Seahawks have Shane Waldron as their offensive coordinator. They work together in Washington. Patriot, I know the Seahawks have salary cap space. Uh, they, they have the assets now to potentially trade for a quarterback. So I think ultimately the Seahawks are going to restart, reset. They're going to take a couple of years to find their franchise quarterback of the future. But if Pete Carroll doesn't want to do that, if he, you know, looks at his birth certificate there and, and sees his age and says that, you know, I'm kind of getting up there as a coach and they don't want to do that hard reset button. Always a possibility, I guess, at least that something could get done there with Kirk Cousins. Let's keep it in the NFC North and talk about Aaron Rodgers. He is coming back to the Green Bay Packers. Uh, he told that pretty obviously to the Pat McAfee show. They reported it this morning through sources, uh, but obviously they have some a very close connection together. Uh, Brad, I'll start off with you here and just talk about this contract situation uh, because you know it was reported there was a four-year, $200 million deal, but Pat McAfee originally said that, that wasn't true. You also came out and said that you know some of the contract details weren't entirely correct. So what kind of went on there with the contract situation? Yeah, so my understanding is it is the four four years for two hundred million with one hundred and fifty million. Excuse me, with one hundred and fifty three million in total guarantees, but he has not actually signed it yet, and there is still a lot to work out there. And folks need to understand that yes, the dollars and cents on the contract, of course, are. are the most important part, but there is so much other language and things that go into this, and that is apparently not done. And so until that happens, I think it complicates matters for both the club and, you know, Roger's representation as they're trying to work through and iron out the fine print that it's being reported this deal is done. So I think until that happens, it's going to be, you know, again, the deal's not going to change. There's not going to be some new contract value that comes out, but Rodgers has made it clear he does want to get paid what he's worth, which it sounds like it's going to happen, but he also wants to help the Green Bay Packers navigate a precarious salary cap situation. And I think in 2022 and 2023, he wants to do everything in his power to lower his cap hits in those years as much as possible. And I think we could see a unique structure here, unlike normal Green Bay Packers contracts, which normally have massive signing bonuses because they don't like to guarantee money outside of the first year of the deal. Maybe they work it a bit, a bit different and the way the money is paid is a bit different to benefit the salary cap of the Packers, but still get that cash in Aaron Rodgers' pocket. I think that we all knew that this was coming to, to some extent. There was some reports in the last few days that, you know, maybe Aaron Rodgers was considering going somewhere else, even potentially the Denver Broncos. Uh, but what do you think about, I guess, the timing of Aaron Rodgers' announcement? We had been anticipating this for a couple of weeks, uh, not only, you know, for Aaron Rodgers to return, but also as it relates to the, the Russell Wilson trade. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the Broncos knew that Rodgers are going to stay, and that's really where they pivoted a couple of weeks ago to Russell Wilson. I think the bigger thing for me, really, about all the Aaron Rodgers stuff is now what do the Packers do from here? Because he's back, clearly the relationship is better, and he wants the team to have more cap space because of this deal for the next couple of years. Where do they go from now? You tag Devontae Adams. They have some key free agents out there, like a Rasul Douglas, like a Devondre Campbell. They would like to bring those guys back. So Darius Smith is a potential cap casualty. How do you keep that team intact and try to improve it even more is what I'm really curious to see now because 
Him coming back is obviously the biggest step here. But how do we improve this roster to eventually go back to where we were last year and get over the hump is the next question for me. And, you know, good for them now is the fact that Tom Brady is no longer in Tampa Bay. Russell Wilson is no longer in Seattle. That NFC is really right there for the taking for them once again. How do we get over that hump now and how do we improve this team? What will Brian Gutekunst do? How much will he actually try to mortgage and kick down the road to improve this roster right now? Is what I'm curious to see how they do business in these next couple of weeks. Let's talk about the franchise tags that occurred today as well. I have to read them off a list since there were eight of them. One quarter of the NFL teams did tag players. That was the Packers with Devontae Adams. Buccaneers wide receiver Chris Godwin, Dolphins tight end Mike Gesicki, Browns tight end David Njoku, Cowboys tight end Dalton Schultz, Chiefs offensive tackle Orlando Brown, Jaguars offensive tackle Cam Robinson, and Bengals safety Jesse Bates. Let's each kind of take one of these. I'm going to start off with Cam Robinson with the Jaguars. I was a little bit surprised by this. I thought that the Jaguars might try to look for an upgrade at offensive tackle, either free agent, either through free agency by spending a lot of money, or even with that number one overall pick. But I do think that tagging Cam Robinson, as long as they intend to keep him around, which I can't imagine there's a lot of value in a trade for a team that's, you know, tagging Cam Robinson for a second time. That's a lot of money. I think that this really directly impacts the top of the 2022 NFL draft where, you know, by tagging Cam Robinson, the Jaguars are basically saying that they're going to take one of those edge rushers, uh, whether it's Aiden Hutchinson or Kayvon Thibodeau, maybe there's a, you know, complete, uh, you know, wild card in there and they take someone like Sauce Gardner, number one overall. I've been really pounding the table. I just literally pounded the table uh, for a cornerback to go number one overall. But uh, yeah, this has some major influence on the NFL draft and in free agency uh, by Cam Robinson getting tagged. Ari, uh, what was your, I guess, biggest takeaway or what was the most notable thing that happened today, the, the franchise tag, tag deadline, you know, other than Rodgers and Wilson? Yeah, I think, you know, we got three tight ends getting tagged was interesting to me. I mean, I think we kind of were expecting Gesicki and expecting to see Dalton Schultz. And Joku came earlier, but that felt a little bit like a surprise. And we've heard about the market of what he's demanding. And now he has 10.9 guaranteed to him. How much will that type of a long-term deal actually come into? But really, when you look at the rest of the tight end market this offseason, that elevates everybody else because those three big names are off the table now. You look at guys like a Zach Ertz or a Robert Tanyan, Evan Ingram, Hayden Hurst, a bunch of mid-tier guys, Gerald Everett, Eric Ebron, CJ Ozama, Rob Gronkowski, if he wants to come back. All these guys are going to be free agents, and they're all out there for the, for, for the taking. And with a deep tight end class in the draft as well, I'm kind of curious to see where those guys actually fall into, especially now that we know that a guy like David Njoku has a $10.9 million tag on him. How much are those guys going to be worth there in the open market with all those other big names now off the table? I'm really curious to see how they do here in free agency next week and how much they're, they're able to get. Brad, we've removed four players from the equation. Who's the who's the most notable left for you? Yeah, the biggest surprise for me, and it's probably how it impacts his teammate, but it's, it's Buccaneers wide receiver Chris Godwin. It seemed like he's obviously playing 2021 on the franchise tag for just under $16 million. It sounded like the team and him were, were optimistic about getting a multi-year extension done this year. Instead, he now has a 19-plus you know, million dollar franchise tag. And, and my, my takeaway is, Cornerback Carlton Davis potentially hitting the open market now. I think there's a very good chance he hits the open market and someone gets into the 16, 17 million per year conversation with him and he might price himself out of Tampa Bay. Uh, final you know, big news of the day was that Mike Williams signed a contract extension with the Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, it was a three-year, $60 million deal, correct? Uh, and that's yeah. you know $20 million per year. The, my biggest takeaway from that was how this, you know, it's, it's related to Amari Cooper and the Dallas Cowboys. And the Dallas Cowboys, if they do intend to actually release Amari Cooper, which they might even have to do after franchise tagging Dalton Schultz, and if they intend to bring back Michael Gallup and Randy Gregory, they're saying that Amari Cooper is not a $20 million wide receiver, whereas the Los Angeles Chargers are now saying that Mike Williams is. And I think that, you know, if you asked a, a layman which of those two wide receivers you'd rather have, I think a lot of people would probably say Amari Cooper just based on what he's done throughout the course of his career. So certainly not saying that the Cowboys are now going to backtrack and keep Amari Cooper or anything like that. But, you know, if you're a, if you're a team out there and you're looking at the contract that Mike Williams just signed and saying, I could get Amari Cooper for that amount of money, you know, now this could potentially open up trade discussions 
for the Dallas Cowboys, where a team would be more willing to give up not a big asset, but something a little bit more minor uh, to get Amari Cooper in the building. But uh, Brad, what was your number one takeaway from the Mike Williams deal? Yeah, I mean, just to stick with the comparison for a second, those guys are probably about the same age, 27, 28 years old. Mike Williams had his first season with more than 50 catches this year in his fifth year on his fifth year option. I think Amari Cooper's had 50 plus receptions in every season of his career since his rookie year in 2014. So I like that connection. For me, though, this is a very strong deal still for the player. They were able to keep it just below Keenan Allen's per year average, which I think probably matters and is influencing the Chris Godwin conversation. But nevertheless, Mike Williams, three years, 60 million, 40 million of that guaranteed with 28 million in first year cash flow. A very strong contract for him could get back on the market potentially in a couple of years when the, the cap spikes and all those things. I thought it was a very big win for his camp. Now, Ari, how does this, this impact the other free agent market out there? Uh, you know, Chris Godwin is still in Tampa Bay. We we kind of knew that was going to happen. I think we had a good idea that Mike Williams was going to stay in L.A., but there are still some top wide receiver options out there, like Odell Beckham Jr., Allen Robinson, uh, some of the more second-tier guys. How do you think this kind of resets the market a little bit of wide receiver? Yeah, you know, it was interesting because there was a report last week that, you know, Dallas and Michael Gallup were getting close to the deal. The number was at 10-11. I feel like that number could actually be higher there for him, especially now that we have Mike getting 20 a year. We'll see what Allen Robinson does. I mean, he was down there in Indy the whole week with his agent talking to talking to some teams. Um, we know he's trying to um, get to that 20. He was trying to get that last year, had a bit of a down year, still trying to get there. But his market might fall towards the 15 to $18 million a year. And then, you know, the thing about Mike, I mean, kind of give us shout out to his agent Tori Daniel might be the busiest busiest guy here this offseason has a Mike has Chris Godwin and has three big time extension eligible receivers as well with um, Debo DK Metcalf and uh, AJ Brown so um, you got two of his wide receivers um, out of the way today still has to finalize a long term deal for Chris Godwin and then he has a busy free agent market and then uh, some extension eligible guys as well so um, he's setting the table very nicely for himself it was nice of the NFL to get all this news out of the way today. I think I'll be working until uh, I'll be, you know, what's that phrase with the midnight oil? I'll be burning the midnight oil tonight, trying to you know, get everything written about today. But uh, still lots going on in the NFL next week with free agency starting. We could see some more trades. Uh, so definitely keep it on PFF.com for all of your news and analysis. Follow Ari on Twitter at my sports update. Follow Brad on Twitter at PFF underscore Brad. Shoot me a follow at Doug Kide as well. And we will see you guys soon.